writers. And you're just going to have to take my word for this one, although you could confirm it for yourself if you read a lot of nonsense works, that lo and behold, nonsense, which because of these misconceptions we think of, a, of as an undifferentiated unitary phenomenon, actually is a very complex phenomenon with many, many different types. As a matter of fact, in my investigation of um, nonsense, which goes back in a way to since when I was a kid, I have identified over 70 different types of nonsense. And incidentally, I and also other friends of mine who is investigating this from a uh, psychological point of view have um, thought that each one of those types of nonsense has its own identifiable and describable effects on the mind. Wish I had more time to go into detail, but this is rather astonishing, some of the effects of nonsense on the mind. So I've said here that there are 70 plus different types, and um, don't worry, <laughs> I'm not going to go through 70 types, but I'll give you some examples of nonsense. And uh, I'm going to talk about three different types here, okay, which you can plainly see are different types. The shiny flazuma easily tubled five sarbic glusters away. Okay, that's one. Right. But now listen to this one. Holiness breeds the vestigial lipstick of spontaneity. Or, listen to this one, that cannibal we just ate was the last one around these parts. Now, I'm assuming that you would all agree that those are all nonsense, but that you can hear the difference in the types, right? So much so that if I said to you, a smiling square root repeated the electric lamp of potatoes, you would be able to recognize that as an example of the second type I gave, right? Or if I said, I'm not an actor, but I play one on television, you would recognize that as an example of the third type. Or if I said, Twas Brillig and the Slithy Tobes, did Gyre and Gimbal in the Wave, you would recognize that as an example of the first type. Okay. Now, um, one thing that we quickly get into complications when you're trying to put order into this thing um, is that, let's see, oh, no, I'll go back a minute on that one. Nonsense can be modeled on absolutely any form of ordinary meaningful language. For example, I can take the format of a definition and I can write nonsense that looks like a definition. Or I could, um, I could, I could focus nonsense around pronouns, for example, and, and listen to this. This is, um, they told me you had been to her and mentioned me to him. She gave me a good character, but said I could not swim. He sent them word I had not gone. We know it to be true. If she should push the matter on, what would become of you? If I or she should chance to be involved in this affair, he trusts to you to set them free exactly as we were, right? Now, that's an example of nonsense that's formulated around pronouns because we can understand pronouns very well, but there has to be some way to establish the referent of the pronoun, and that's what Carol undermines here, so it's nonsense. We could do it with conjunctions. We could do it with all kinds of things, but most significantly for the kind of thing that we are talking about here, I need to point out that even when you take a certain format of language and you lay nonsense down on the layer of it, you non on the layer on top of it, you nonetheless, nonetheless have a sense of that form of language. Now, that's abstract, but let me give you an example. When I was in high school, I was eighth grade, and I read this Biography of Lincoln by Carl Sandburg. I think it was where I read this story. But when Lincoln was president, and I forgot the occasion, it was a very solemn state occasion, and everybody was gathered around, and his 
uh, part in the ceremony called for him to mount a horse and to lead the procession away from the scene. But in the event, when he got up on the horse, the horse put its own back hoof up and got it caught in the stirrup. So the horse was jumping around, and everybody shocked into silence. Oh, poor Mr. Lincoln, it's so embarrassing for the president. So Lincoln looked down at the horse, and he said, well, if you're getting on, I'm getting off. <laughs> now, if you think about it for a moment, you've got to agree it's nonsense, but that nonetheless, right, it brings a very vivid image if you're, to your mind of that very motion, right? This is a very favorite technique of nonsense writers, is to take the format of a travel narrative and lay a layer of nonsense down on it, and you can feel that sense of motion in your mind. Listen to this one, a 19th century nonsense poem. Why and wherefore set out one day to hunt for a wild negation? They agreed to meet at a cool retreat on the point of interrogation. But the night was dark and they missed their mark and driven well nigh to distraction. They lost their ways in a murky way, maze of utter abstruse abstraction. And so on. Now, I've been <clears throat> monitoring the effects of that poem on my students since 1969, and I can tell you the normal response is people say that even though they know full well that that's nonsense, that nonetheless, it nonetheless gives them a sense of motion in their mind. Okay. Now, um, All of this nonsense, the many types, nonetheless have a single universal structural principle in common. And that is that all types of nonsense have the following structure in common, that they respect some rules of language, but they violate other rules of language so that the some or the outcome of it is unintelligible. And let me give you just one example. We could go through all the types, but for example, when I say, "'Twas brillig in the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave." Is that a grammatically correct English sentence? Yes, it's grammatically correct. All the adjectives and nouns are in proper order. Twa but and also, there's, it has some made-up words in it that don't mean anything, but let me ask you this. Um, brillig, and uh, twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. Do they sound like Russian words? No. Do they sound like Polish words or Portuguese words? or Jack No. Do they sound like English words? Yes. So this type of nonsense uses the phonetic structure of ordinary meaningful English words and makes up nonsense around them and it puts them in a grammatically correct format and the grammatically correct format enables you to say even though the word is meaningless what part of speech it is. Twas brillig and the slithy toves, what part of speech is slithy? Adjective, right? Um, now, so that is the structural formula, as I said, that underlies all nonsense. Now, to bring this to a close here, because, uh, you know, we have a lot of folks to get through now, um, I want to point out that one thing we can um, realize once we start thinking about nonsense in a systematic way, it's a very simple way of showing that when the mind switches, from one state of existence or framework of existence to some other incompatible framework of existence, then the mind necessarily generates nonsense in that transition. This here is a picture by Escher. It's one of his drawings. And I just put this one up here, to, which is a good example of it, but um, is the general principle of all of these things is the same, that he drew impossible geometry, right? And, Maybe the one that most are familiar with was the one of the water wheel. You know, the water is coming off the mill chute and it goes over the wheel. And then you follow the water and it goes down one trough and then it turns an angle, goes down the other. Then another angle, goes down the other. Then another angle, goes down the other. And then it's right back at the top of the wheel. Okay. 
So one thing this shows us, if you took a protractor and a ruler and what graphic artists call a value scale, you could, you could create a perfectly intelligible and meaningful description of this as a two-dimensional surface. You could say that, angle, that line there is seven inches long, it goes off of this line at a 43 degree angle and, and so on. And the, the value scale is what um, artists use to uh, evaluate all the shades from bright white to complete black. And you could do it, it would be a complicated task, but you could do it. But if you try to describe the scene in the drawing, it's nonsense. That the water goes down, 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 and then it's up, you know, where it started. So, what this indicates to me is that if somebody, let's say by hypothesis, were to go to some other dimension of existence, take a trip to another realm of existence, and came back, then when they came back and tried to put it into words, they would be forced to talk nonsense about it. So what this indicates to me is it's a very critical thing whether we can put credence on near-death experiences or not depends on are they literally nonsensical. And if they are, then we're in trouble because that's an indicator in my mind that the person didn't go to another realm of existence. So the question is, do near-death experience narratives, are they nonsense? And my answer is yes, because it's a type of nonsense we just discussed. Because, um, you know, the presupposition with a near-death experience is that people say it, it's, there are no words, and it wasn't in time, it was a timeless experience, and it wasn't in space. And yet, how do they synthesize all these things to try to describe it to us, they say. I got out of my body, body, I went through a tunnel into a light, I met my deceased relatives, I saw my life pass in review, I returned to my body and came back to life. That's a travel narrative. But we grasp the meaning of travel narratives because of the concepts of space and time. So we're dealing here with a nonsensical travel narrative, which sounds shocking in the light of these common misconceptions about nonsense. But if you take the real deal about nonsense and realize that this is a very important and essential domain of human expression, then you get to realize that, uh, well, this is a good thing, because now we're, we're safe at least this far. Okay. Now, 